One of the most successful pop songs of 1986 was one that sort of defied the, the uh, typical song of that particular year. Uh, 1986 was filled with a lot of synthesized pop music. I love all that music, very popular, and a lot of danceable kind of music, which was yet another kind of thing, and that really predominated the American and worldwide charts the entire year. The real exception was this artist who was sort of a jazz pianist. His name is Bruce Hornsby, and he teamed up with a session band that then be called Bruce Hornsby and the Range. The song, The Way It Is, was number one in America and numerous countries all around the world for multiple weeks, one of the biggest hits of 1986. Different from all the other music, its arrangement was rather traditional with uh, three verses, but what was untraditional about it, the typical bridge that you find in a pop song was missing, and if you know the song, and anybody's heard radio knows the song, they continue to play it. The bridge, such that we may call it that, are just these lovely piano solos that happen all the way through there. Uh, it's just a very arresting song. It remains that way to this day, the way it is. You know, I, I love the song, I love the melody, I like the way that it worked. I think I never really quite grasped what the song was saying. And the verses really tell a pretty important story. So we start out with the opening verse. Standing in line, marking time, waiting for the welfare dime, because they can't buy a job. The man in the silk suit hurries by. He catches the poor old lady's eye. Just for fun, he says, get a job. That's just the way it is. Some things will never change. That's just the way it is. Ah, but don't you believe them? The second verse goes further to deal with racial disparities, which were known to us in 1986 and continue to be known to us in 2022. These disparities have been around for a long time, but the verse can brings it up. The second verse says, said, hey, little boy, you can't go where the others go because they don't look like, you don't look like they do. Said, hey, old man, how can you stand to think that way? Did you really think about it before you made the rules? He said, son, that's just the way it is. Some things will never change. That's just the way it is. Ah, but don't you believe them? Final verse of the song gets right to the uh, punch of the civil rights legislation that had been passed, but that more was needed thought so in that particular time. The closing verse says, oh yeah, they passed a law in 64 to give those who ain't got a little more, but it only goes so far, but the law doesn't change another's mind when all it sees at the hiring time is the line on the color bar. No, no, that's just the way it is, and some things will never change. Many years later, Bruce Hornsby's brother wrote about this particular song, and that kind of provided me the information to present this to the opening part of the homily this evening. He mentioned about the structure of the song, the three different stories that were going in there, but it was that part, that's the way it is. Some things will never change. That's the way it is. Ah, but don't you believe them. Remember, I told you this was an unconventional song. A conventional song, the narrator is the same person all the way through. Not so in this song. The, uh, the man that rebukes the woman in the welfare line and the other one who tells the young uh, person of color that, uh, that simply the, that the rules are not going to change, people are going to change their mind. These are different voices in the song. And those voices in each verse are singing the first three lines of what I call the refrain. That's just the way it is. Some things will never change. That's just the way it is. And his brother revealed to us that a different voice is saying, the artist is saying, the composer is saying, ah, oh, but don't you believe them? First century Israel is not that much different, in, uh, at least philosophically, than 21st century America or contemporary culture that we live in. The uh, first century would have been dealt with the Roman occupation of Israel and the harshness that came as a result of that. Life was not simple for most people. And just like we have in 2022, first century Judaism where Jesus was born was filled with class distinctions. There was the rich, there was the poor, there was the middle class in between. There were the elite, there was the non-elite. There were the educated, the vast majority of uneducated, and illiterate. There were those with power which were small, numbering very few with them. And then, of course, the Roman occupiers, which were uh, 
constantly being difficult and uh, unpredictable in so many different ways. First century Judaism had all of this. The apostles would have been quite aware of that. In fact, when Jesus called them, it's already a striking thing because they weren't members of the elite class. They weren't educated. They weren't literate, as best we really know. They didn't have any wealth, although they were thoroughly middle class. And they would hear the teaching of Jesus firsthand about how the poor will always be with us because there are keys to get into the kingdom of heaven. That's a story for homily later on in this year. Nevertheless, as uh, the apostles piece all of this together, the, the almost ridiculousness, the unpredictability of their call to anything, to be with this person, you see, that struck them as odd because they already know what was baked into the cake, that the elite have all the power, that the elite pulls all the strings, that most people feel nothing but oppression. Life is difficult, and it, and it doesn't end well, and that nothing really good comes from it. Reminds me of a saying my sister always liked to say when she was going to state the obvious. For example, if she'd come with me to the parade yesterday, she didn't. But if she did, and we remarked that it was bitter cold, which it was, she would simply say, it is what it is. She said this for 60 years of her life. And it is what it is is a great sentence that says nothing. I mean, it's basically just existential. It is what it is. That is the way it is. Note the striking similarity. And so in the first century, it was just simply accepted. This is the way things are, and they are never going to change. Then came the trip up Mount Tabor. Uh, Deacon Will and I were privileged to be there in 2018. I also went an earlier time in 2013. Any trip to the Holy Land will involve a trip up to the top of the mountain where today's gospel takes place. It's quite the trip. You have to go up on switchback roads in uh, little minivans. The day we went uh, the second time around, rain, fog, everything you could imagine, terrible weather, you couldn't see anything. And you get up to the top of this magnificent basilica has been built or our gospel took place today. You're forced to imagine what would this place be like without all of these buildings, without all of these pilgrims. What would it be like? A very high mountain that four people climbed to go to the top to do what? There was absolutely nothing up there. The disciples, James, Peter, and John go up with Jesus, and then we get the gospel story. He is transfigured before them. Admittedly, we can't quite grasp what this is. We get a sense that it's a blinding light that seems to work. Uh, the apostles were not clued in, and suddenly they woke up and saw this. Moses and Elijah are pressed for how anyone knows they're there. We, it's never explained to us. Let's face it, what's happening is an experience that simply defies explanation, which why the church has always said James, Peter, and John had a mystical experience on the top of a very real mountain. They went up with Jesus Christ and he was transfigured before them. He was as if they had never seen him before. The voice comes from the cloud, which they find terrifying. You would too. I would three. The voice from the cloud says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then all that light goes away. Moses and Elijah go, we do not know where. And Jesus is suddenly himself again. And they move down the mountain. And I love this last detail. The disciples did not speak about what they had seen. Why did they not speak about it? The easy answer is that they didn't understand what they'd seen. What was there to speak about? And each person may have had their own particular experience of this phenomenon, and not be able to make sense of it. And knowing the story as you and I know it, because we're in Lent and we're going to move into Holy Week, there's a trajectory to Lent. Everyone knows the story of the Holy Week. We're going to focus on the passion of Jesus, and that's where this story is going. The Roman occupiers, in uh, some collaboration with the Jewish power structure, is going to put Jesus to death and try to end his movement once and for all. And the disciples can't quite figure this out. The whole time that they're moving closer and closer to the inevitable events on Good Friday. You see, Jesus brought them up to the top of the mountain so that they would have something to grasp in the darkness that was going to be Good Friday. And even though they were clueless, even though they were witless, and on Holy Thursday you sort of see that, they fall asleep, they run away, do all that stuff they're doing, that transfiguration experience was still in their minds, that mystical experience. And it is on Easter Sunday when Jesus appears to them that 
once again get that mystical experience. The stories we get do not get details. We can't tell what's Jesus wearing. We can't tell uh, how he appears and how people first don't recognize him and then they do. But why don't we just settle on it being mystical? If we do that, we've got all the language that we need. The mountaintop was mystical. The post-resurrection experience was mystical. And what was Jesus doing? Remember, God on the mountain told the disciples, do of whatever he tells you. And every time you and I gather together to celebrate the Eucharist, that's precisely what we do. He says, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body. Take this, all of you, and drink of it. This is my blood. Some things may never change in a pop song. Everything changes in a mystical experience. I had a mystical experience my second year of seminary, and I've never been willing to speak about it publicly. And this weekend, now you're the fourth time I've preached, so this weekend I have finally told at least as much of the story as I feel comfortable with telling. Uh, those that know a bit of my story know that when uh, my close friend Michael died in 1993, I entered into the seminary just a few months later, and I was in a dark place. I may not have been able to tell you that part before, but a dark place, and the only way I could sort of handle the numbness that had come from this jarring experience was to put it away, to stick it in the back of my mind, to not allow myself to think about it or to go there. And I invested all my energy in going into school and doing the academic thing, making new friends, being everything that I was going to be, a model student. That's what I was going to be. The second year, we went on a retreat, a seven-day silent retreat. And if you're curious, my silence lasted about half of the first day. I made an effort at it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, most parts of it were silent. There was kind of no real way to speak with a handful of people who were willing to break the rules. And it was in Thursday of that week, the second to last day of the retreat, that I had that mystical experience. All I can say is that it was so surprising, and I wasn't sure what it was. The only thing I knew to do the next day, we met each day with our spiritual director. I met Sister Joan Allen the next day and told her what had happened. I, I thought she might say I was out of my mind. And instead, she said, you've had a mystical experience. And I went away, and like the apostles coming down the mountain, said nothing more about it to anyone. It was 10 years after I was ordained, I took a group over to Medjugorje. Medjugorje is in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it is a place where the apparitions are not yet approved by the church, so each person has their own, uh, make their own decision about whether they're willing to believe that what's happening there. The Blessed Mother appearing in the 1980s to uh, these seven children and giving them messages and continuing to give those messages uh, down to this very day. I was really drawn to it. I went as a skeptic and I went hook, line, and sinker in the first hour that I was there and became a believer. I remember hearing an extraordinary number of confessions. They're the most I think I've ever heard in one particular seating and it had a huge impact on me. One of the things that you do in Medjugorje is you listen to the visionaries when they give what's called their talks. Their talk is their story. What they saw when they were children. How they lived their life now. What they gleaned from it. I remember we went to the, there were only two male missionaries, the older of the two, Yvonne, went to Yvonne's talk. And while we're sitting in there, Yvonne talked about a moment when the Blessed Mother appeared to him and said she wanted to show him something. And so without any explanation of how this happened, if he picked up or whatever, it's just simply this apparition that's happening, he suddenly described what he saw, which was dazzling white light, a sense of warmth, uh, a sense of no limit to what was being happening, and a great sense of great peace at seeing what it was that he saw. I bolted up in my seat with 2,000 people in the auditorium for hearing this because without any question in my mind, he described exactly, precisely, every bit of the mystical experience I had that I was not willing to say to another person. It was a surprise. 
You know, I've asked myself, and that's why I've summoned the courage to talk about it this weekend, you know, why, why did I not talk about it? Why didn't think I was the right person to talk about it? Yvonne has the blessed mother appearing to him. I don't have that. And so there's not really anything that goes with that. But then I remembered this movie called Network, one of the great movies of the 1970s. It's a satire about uh, television. Famously, the broadcaster loses his mind. He's a Howard Beale. And I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. But later on in the film, he has an epiphany because the uh, head of the corporation now wants to put him to bankroll his uh, message. And he can't figure out why he's being chosen because he's literally out of his mind. And the corporate executive says to it, him, because you're on television, dummy. And the same thing happens. Yvonne had a microphone. That's why I told his story. And it's taken me 22 years to discover I have the same kind of microphone. But this just becomes narcissistic. It's about me trying to describe to you a vision that I've never really fully understood and not the point of bringing it up this evening. The point of bringing it up this evening is to bring up the, the obvious, that when we come to celebrate Eucharist, we are in a mystical experience. And the, of necessity, we attempt to orient ourselves to something we can explain, something we can understand, something that makes sense, which is why we focus on things like, I like the music or I hate the music. You know, the baby crying uh, uh, interrupts me. I get distracted. Somebody thinks it takes too long. Someone thinks it's not long enough. They wonder how good the chili's going to be. It really is going to be good, by the way. Uh, these are all different things we do to basically get some grasp, some handle on what it is we're doing. Because stripped down to its very essentials, everything about this sacrament is, at, is mystical. It is not available to our intellect. It is not available to our understanding. We can't control it, grasp it, do anything with it. Much like me, powerless to see this vision that I see, we are powerless when the Eucharist is consecrated in front of us. We don't make it happen, and I sure as H don't make it happen either. This is something that God makes happen, and you and I are witnesses, so to speak, of this event. He chooses to mystically reveal himself every time we celebrate the Eucharist together, saying that I am here. I am the creator of the universe. You are my child. You have value. Where else on earth will you hear that message? You won't find it any other place than where this Eucharist is being celebrated. The mystical experience is at the epicenter of the liturgy. Remember, the apostles thought that's just the way it is, living in an oppressive society, that they were never going to be on top. They were never going to be the elite. They first thought Jesus might be there grabbed the rung on the ladder that would take them up higher than they'd been before, but the events of Holy Week reminded them that their path was going to be difficult, just like ours. The apostles did not live the life of Riley after Jesus ascended into heaven. Every one of them, except John, was martyred for their faith. And in the attempt that went on decade after decade after decade to squash what Jesus had begun, but they could not squash because it was of divine origin. And, and from the beginning, they celebrated the Eucharist essentially the way you and I are doing it this evening. This Eucharist was not something for us to control. It was not something for us to grasp. It was not something for us to modify, to make relevant, to do all the little different things we're tempted to do with it. It's simply God's gift of a mystical experience to each one of us so that our darkness can be punctuated by his light. And that's what makes the final line of the song, The Way It Is, I believe, so beautiful. When we learn in those verses that there's a different voices, and that the voices, which I think is the voice of Satan, if you really want who the voice is, is the one that says, that's just the way it is. Some things will never change. That's just the way it is. And then that heavenly voice pierces through the final verse and says, ah, but don't you believe them. Here's what we believe. Everything changes. The bread and the wine are things. They're in the back of the church this evening. We're processing them up publicly for the first time in two years this evening. They are things, yet a mystery, mystical experience you and I cannot possibly grasp. They will become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You and I will receive it. We will be told the body of Christ. And so obvious what has really happened to us. Everything changes. You see, if the bread and the wine changes, everything changes. Things do not remain the same. And here in the middle of Lent, we're left with a task. We're supposed to change too. 
And you know, the whole idea about Lent is to focus on what do I need to do to be a better disciple? How can I better be an uh, emulator of light in the world that's filled with darkness? And our Lenten journey is filled with all kinds of pitfalls. The devil's always there to distract us, to move us off our way, to convince us that we're not up to the challenge that's happening. But the one thing the devil cannot undo is the mystical experience you and I receive this evening where we see our very own existential reality changed into the magnificent reality of heaven. I now know that's the vision that I received before. I now understand more fully why I'm so passionate about the sacrament, because of what incredible gift this is that God gives to us. But the world is going to continue to ask us to be existentialists. It's going to ask us to say it is what it is when we see suffering, when we see war, when we see pandemics, when we see personal failure. It is what it is. That's just the way it is. Some things never change. Except God reminds us. Ah, but don't you believe it? 